Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Andy Pollard. I'm the Senior EPA Delivery Manager. So I will be taking you through um, some of the slides today in relation to the Level 3 Awards for Endpoint Assessors. You will also be hearing from Sarah James, who is a Senior Development Manager. And both of us worked on this uh, qualification. We looked at the assessment criteria, the unit content. So part of this hour will be to share with you the specification and some of the key details which you need to be aware of in particular especially if you will be delivering this because there is a caveat within the skills unit which Sarah will talk a little bit more about. So the aims of the session. So what we are going to be sort of talking you through this afternoon is giving you a background as to why this qualification has been designed. So there's always a rationale as to why qualifications are built and there is always a need within the sector. We'll be discussing the centre recognition and approvals process. We'll be exploring both units. So we'll be discussing the knowledge unit and the skills unit. And we'll also be suggesting assessment approaches. So by suggesting, this is only what we think may work. Obviously, as sector experts working within uh, training providers, you are free to use your own internal assessment documents, but we just thought we would share what could be used. Sarah will be exploring the skills unit in detail, and what we will be doing is a little activity just to start thinking about assessment and evidence which can be used. And then we'll be sharing the assessment and the IQA strategy, which underpins everything in relation to this qualification. As we go through, please do use the questions button and the questions uh, pane. We'll be keeping an eye on the questions and as and when uh, appropriate, we'll be answering them as we go through. But also at the end of the session, we will be creating a FAQ document and that will get shared on the Pearson website along with a recording of this session. OK, so if we start off with what is the qualification? So what is the background in terms of structure, looking at what what are the two sort of qualifications? within this um, this BTEC award. So we've got the BTEC Level 3 award in principles of endpoint assessment. When we look at the size and structure, it is one mandatory unit with a guided learning hours of 30. And the unit title is understanding the principles of endpoint assessment. It's assessed through internal assessment and we'll be touching on internal assessment later on in the slides and it was was regulated by Ofqual in um, the end of August this year ready for start in September 2020. We've got the qualification number there for you so it's easier to find within the Pearson uh, website. So that is the, the knowledge only unit so that is unit one. When we look at unit one and two, so the combined sort of qualification with the knowledge unit and the skills unit, the title there is level three award for endpoint assessors. Guided learning hours is 60 with two mandatory units. And again, the knowledge unit, understanding the principles of endpoint assessment has to be uh, achieved and the skills unit is assessing competence through endpoint assessment. Similar again, it's assessed through internal assessment and has an operational start date of September 2020. One of the key things to note with this qualification is this does include a skills unit. We know that there are other endpoint assessment awards which are available. But Pearson have devised a skills unit to support the learner into an endpoint assessor role. So if we have a look at why this qualification was developed. So 
we're aware that there are other qualifications on the market. And as I mentioned, these qualifications are purely focused on the knowledge only. Now, within all of the assessment plans which relate to endpoint assessment, there is always a line within the occupational um, competence aspect for assessors in that independent endpoint assessors must hold a recognised tackle qualification or A1 qualification, or back in the day, D32 to D33. But we're noticing more and more that a recognised EPA qualification is also acceptable. So that was one of the main drivers for developing this qualification. We're also aware that there are a lot of occupationally competent staff within a range of sectors. So sectors being sort of niche areas. Systems engineering is one, for example. Mammography is another. Uh, even right down to healthcare. So there are various occupationally competent staff who meet the knowledge, skills and behaviours of the EPA assessment plan, but they don't hold a recognised assessor qualification. So again, this qualification was built with those individuals in, the, in mind. We've broke it down to knowledge and skills to make sure that it, it follows the same pattern as the TACWA suite of qualifications. And also, once achieved, the learner will meet the assessment plan requirement of a recognised assessor qualification. We have had it, uh, this qualification regulated by Ofqual. And again, one of the reasons for that is within the assessment plans, there is a statement st uh, saying a recognised assessor qualification, which is where Ofqual recognition comes in. So that's just a little bit of background as to why we've done it. So for centres who are interested in delivering this qualification, if you are an existing Pearson centre, you will also have auto approval if you are currently approved for the assessor and verifier suite of qualifications. If for whatever reason, the auto approval hasn't happened, contact your account manager who will be able to assist you through the process. If you are a new centre, you will need to apply and be granted recognition as per our BTEC rules. And the centre approval process, just as a, a brief introduction, consists of a credit check and then a discussion of which qualifications you're interested in delivering on behalf of Pearson. Now, what I've done is that I've put the approval link into the slides. And then, as you can see, work based learning, becoming a centre. And then it breaks it down into the credit checks and then UK work based learning centres. Or if you're a college, click through to the college. And then it gives you all the, the information there, particularly with the Work-based learning centre support email, or if you're an FE college, FE centre support, or you can complete the uh, form, and then that will get routed to the appropriate team. Okay. So once centre recognition has occurred, there is then the approvals process. So. Within all of our specifications and within our uh, website, we do state what the approvals process is. So all centres, so regardless of whether you, you are classified as a training provider or an FE college, you're required to enter into an approval agreement with Pearson. And this is where the head of centre or principal agrees to meet all the requirements of the qual spec and to comply with the policies, procedures and codes of practice alongside regulations of Pearson and relevant regulatory bodies. So things like safeguarding, equality, diversity and inclusion. The seniority is that a confirmation is provided to Pearson that you will uphold the qualification and specification, but also maintain external regulations. 
if centres don't comply with the agreement or if evidence is provided that centres aren't meeting the approval criteria, this could result in suspension of certification or withdrawal of centre and or qualification approval. So in terms of centre staffing, Unit 1, the knowledge, the knowledge only unit, assessors and internal quality assurers who have knowledge, understanding and competence in the sphere of endpoint assessment. So if you're thinking of delivering this qualification, looking at your staffing, looking at the staff training needs, the staff matrix, do you have assessors and internal quality assurers who have the knowledge, understanding and competence in relation to endpoint assessment? Some considerations in terms of how the centre staff can demonstrate this could be through CPD courses, which are bespoke to endpoint assessment, or undertaking independent endpoint assessor training for any endpoint assessment organisation. When we're moving on to the skills unit, one of the key considerations is that judgments made by the trainee EPA assessor, so the learner who was undertaking this qualification, they must be countersigned by an endpoint assessor who meets the requirements of the vocational assessment plan before being accepted as valid. So to give you an example, you may have a learner who is undertaking business admin endpoint assessment. Your internal assessor meets the requirements, but has an occupational background of adult care. For the skills unit, the counter signature element must be by a business admin approved endpoint assessor or an assessor that has occupational competence within business admin. So very much like in the tackle qualifications where counter signature requirements are needed, it's the same in the skills unit. So again, during the approval process, centre staffing arrangements will be re reviewed and confirmed as suitable. And then for existing centres, this will be reviewed as part of the normal SV activity. So if I just hand over now to Sarah, who will take you through the units. Um, just, just to provide a little bit of background as to how we develop the qualification. Um, Andy and I actually work quite closely together in, in developing the, this um, qualification because we very, very much drew on the experiences that Andy and his team have had as endpoint um, assessors and the experiences that they've that they have learnt from from um, the both the the very early endpoint assessments that they've been involved in and also how endpoint assessment has has evolved over the, the past couple of years and actually it was a really exciting time to write um, a qualification about this because I think we're kind of finally at that point where there's enough stability for us to be able to see what it is that that Pearson needs in in endpoint assessors and therefore what endpoint assessment organizations generally um, will need in in endpoint assessors so if we can move on to look at the um at the at the first unit um so the, the first unit unit one has six learning outcomes um which basically um, develop the, the understanding of the learner who is either working as an endpoint assessor, but it might also be somebody who is, um, who is actually interested in working as an endpoint assessor in, in the future. And so it isn't, it isn't, um, it can either be done um, kind of alongside the, the skills unit potentially, or it can be done prior to to the skills unit um, in order to to move on to the the um the skills unit in in the future and it's very very much um a balance between a bit of the the, the educational theory assessment theory that 
they they require in in the role but also the kind of practical knowledge of what do you do in this situation how would you approach this what do you need to think about as you as you um undertake your role as as an IEA um it also includes um some background um knowledge as well so knowledge of um things like how you know what what endpoint assessment is and how it's how it's underpinned by um, by reg by regulators and um, and other organisations. So um, so basically, it, it incorporates um, key areas such as the, the concepts and principles, how to assess, process for planning. So that's you know actually physically what you do in in the planning process. Um, importance of communication. Because um, communication is is extremely important um, in in this in this process, as it's it's complex and difficult for learners, and so how how it's communicated is is really really important. Quality assurance and also um, continuing professional development. So, does any does anybody have any thoughts on the topics that are covered in this unit that they want to drop into chat? If not, we can we can move on to um, to the next slide. Um, there will be opportunity for questions and comments at at the at the end anyway. And if you have any questions as I'm as I'm talking, please drop them drop them um, in so that so that we're able to to see them. So so basically, um, the units are set up much as we would set up the units for any for any qualification. And this slide shows an example of the content and how we've set out the content um, to be delivered during during this course. And we've been we've tried to set out the content in a very plain, very simple way that will support both um, the tutors delivering um, this course. But it will also support the learners in in understanding what they the the stuff that they need to cover in order to in order to um in order to pass this particular unit. So one one thing that it it is worth um make making a point about here is that sometimes people get a little bit um confused about we've got 4A pre-assessment briefing, 4B effective communication for endpoint assessment. Sometimes people expect those to line up perfectly with the, with the assessment criteria, and that isn't necessarily how it, how it works because the, the content is very, very much based on a holistic model of what it is that needs to be learnt, and then the assessment criteria are the things that learners need to be able to do and understand as as a result of that of that process but very very much this content is designed to be the right learning to support um, those assessment criteria i mean you can you can see here that very very much this this uh, matches what i said a minute ago where you've got this is it, this is very very much about practical knowledge it's about how to do it you know so it's about how to conduct that pre-assessment briefing you know um the thinking about what each person needs to get out of it to make sure that it's um it's at, at the best um standard possible and that it meets the objectives um and then we've got effective communication for endpoint assessment which is which is basically the um all of the all of the different um things that people need people need um to to think about as they are um as they are communicating during the the endpoint assessment okay um we we also in in our um units and this is this is something that we have been including um in our BTEC specialist qualifications a lot more in um in the last couple of years we have included some fairly specific um, assessment guidance um, at the end of this unit as it is as it is a knowledge unit 
And so um, the, the, the point about this, um, these assessment tasks is it's that there are kind of two purposes to them. Firstly, they are to clarify clearly what would be a reasonable level of assessment for the unit. Secondly, it's also quite simply designed in order to make life easier for customers so that if you wish to, you can really pull these assessment activities out of the spec and help the learners to, um, to present that evidence in a contextualised uh, manner. Because what, what, we, what we expect here isn't, isn't a kind of theoretical account of what a planning meeting might be like. It's, it's the, the expectation is that the learners actually um, apply this to the endpoint assessments that they are personally involved in assessing. So, you know, somebody might be involved in, um, in assessing for example, um, adult care, and the whole idea would be that they would they would um, contextualise these assessments in into that particular context where necessary, broadening to get that breadth, comparing to to other um, selected EPAs so that they understand the differences um, between them. So the idea is these are very very much designed to be used. In, um, in a very, very um, real life type of context. Um, if I can move on. Um, so these, these verbs are some examples of verbs that we use in the, um, in the specification. Um, the, and so um, these, as I say, these verbs are examples of ones that we use in, in the specification. Um, and we, we try to be really, really um, clear about what the definitions are. And we try to use verbs that don't overlap too much with each other. Um, so all, all of the verbs that we use have, have a really, really clear meaning. And these, as I say, these, these are some examples of, of verbs. And the, the, um, the, within the spec, if you, if you look in the spec right at the back, there is um, an example of um, the, the table at the back has all of the ones that are actually included in, in this specification. I think it's pretty much like this, but, I, but there is analyze and, and evaluate in there. And I don't think we actually use review in this particular um, specification, but they all have very, very clear meanings and we, we use and apply those meanings. And so you need to check um, the terms in the back of the spec to make sure that they, that they match with your, with your understanding. OK, so if I move on to unit two, unit two is a skills unit which is very which is designed to sit alongside the knowledge unit. Um, and it, it can be delivered in in two ways. So you can either do them at the same time so that they complement each other in that way, or you can do the knowledge unit first and then do the skills unit in, in order to apply. And, and it really depends on, on what the um, learner's personal situation is. So if the learner is somebody who is already in an EPA assessor role, perhaps because it's a, a shortage um, subject and they really need to be moved into that quickly, then the sensible way to do it would be to do them alongside. If somebody is interested in a role, it would be more sensible to do the um, knowledge unit first and then move on to the skills unit and make it a kind of longer thinner um, course but very 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 much we've we've designed these so that they sit alongside each other you will notice things like um, the, the terminology the expectations some of the content will be really very very similar because the whole idea is, is that the first unit is about underpinning knowledge then the second one is about is about going and doing it 
So clearly, we're expecting them to apply pretty much the same range in, in the skills as, um, as we would in, in the knowledge. So, so then, um, in terms of essential resources, it is very, very um, important to point out that you can't just do this unit um, because, you, because um, it's something you fancy doing. Um, you really you need to either be employed in or acting in the role of an IEA to be able to complete this unit. So it's it's very similar the way that the assessment is set out um, to the um, to the other to the old assessor qualifications, where basically you need to follow through the process of endpoint assessment for two learners in order to be able to um, in order to be able to complete this this particular unit so um, and and as, as Andy said earlier the judgments need to be countersigned by um, an experienced endpoint assessor who meets the requirements of the assessment plan before being accepted as valid so again that's that's very very much in line with the with the assessor qualifications um, and yeah and I've already said that learners must assess a minimum of two learners and, and present that evidence as as part of a portfolio I have the next slide um, and then as, as I said as I said a minute ago the delivery is very very much in line with the with the knowledge unit. And you will find that some of this will, will seem to be overlapping a little bit. And the, the reason for that is, as I said, is because the knowledge unit is where you um, get the knowledge. This is then where you apply and use that knowledge in your to show in your skills that you are able to do these things. So that so the range of the two is is fairly similar. Again, We've got 1A, 1B, um, and then there will be assessment criteria that, that relate to, to those. So this one is happens to be about gateway um, and the, how, you know, taking learners or taking apprentices through gateway to and showing that you that you know that process and you're able to apply it in order to in order to um, do it and demonstrate those skills. Okay, so um, just just an activity then to for us to to finish off. Andy, do you want to take back over now? Yep, yeah, I will do. Thanks, Sarah. So I can see loads of questions coming in. That's really fantastic. What we'll do at the end is we'll boil down the questions, then we'll give you some responses while we're still presenting. But as we go through, please do keep using the questions box because, as I said earlier, we will be devising an FAQ guide which can support you going forward. So Sarah's gone through the unit one, which is the knowledge unit, the underpinning knowledge, which will support learners who undertake unit two. So this activity is based on the unit two assessment criteria. And it's in relation to learning outcome one, which is all around confirming gateway requirements. So as, as people working with them within endpoint assessment, gateway is the critical point where the apprentice moves from a in training slash on program phase over into endpoint assessment. So thinking as an assessor, what evidence would you expect a learner to present to meet the following three criteria? So how would you assess that the, the learner has reviewed gateway evidence against set requirements, com, uh, confirmed the accuracy of gateway evidence, and communicated that the apprentice is now in the assess, end point assessment period? In addition, we also need to think about as an assessor, how do we confirm reliability? So if I just give you a few moments to have a think, 
what evidence would you accept as an assessor from the learner to meet these three criteria and in addition how can we confirm reliability I can see some really good responses coming in. We'll give it a moment and then I will share some of the responses. So I'm seeing some really good responses. What about reliability? How can you as an assessor confirm reliability? Brilliant, so a lot of the responses were, were products which is exactly what we'd be expecting. So things like um, EPA or Endpoint Assessment Organisations Pro Formers that are used to confirm the learner is ready for Endpoint Assessment, reviewing Gateway Declaration documents, making sure that signatures are recorded. Again, confirmation from the qualified EPA in the subject area that they confirm the gateway conversations are accurate and correct. Um, employee statements, again, we've got discussions. So as Sarah mentioned earlier, because Unit 2 requires evidence to be provided from two apprentices that are undertaking endpoint assessment, having those work products so depending on which endpoint assessment organisation um, you're working with, gateway evidence will be the same as that's determined by the assessment plan. But endpoint assessment organisations may use different systems, they may use different processes, different approaches. So speaking from a Pearson perspective, we use a system, screenshots, could be uh, valid evidence to confirm gateway. In terms of communicating that the apprentice is now in the EPA period, again, screenshots or um, written notes which confirm from the independent endpoint assessor or endpoint assessment organisation to say yes, all the gateway evidence is valid. So if we just move on. So with regards to qualification, resources and support, we've got the qualification specification that is available on Pearson's website. What we've done is we've stripped out some of the key sort of highlights just to share with you during this webinar around assessment criteria, around learning outcomes, assessment approaches, centre recognition and approvals. But we've also got CRM support. So for existing centres, you can access support from your business development manager or curriculum development manager. But there is also the um, portal whereby you can raise a case and ask a question and that will get routed to the most relevant department. One of the key things to bear in mind is make sure that you opt in for any updates. We are seeing a large number of customers explain, uh, stating that they're not receiving key information and when we've looked into it deeper is because 
you have opted out of receiving updates from Pearson. If that is the case, again, go through the portal, indicate that you are, pre, uh, you are not receiving um, Pearson updates and the marketing team will sort that out for you. As this qualification is a, a BTEC qualification, you will have standards verification visits and within the sector there is a senior standards verifier. So you will have support from your standards verifiers from Pearson in relation to any aspect of this qualification and there are regular newsletters which are produced by the portfolio manager and then shared out through emails insight magazines so just to make you aware that there are resources which will help and also there is support available in addition you may want to explore additional learning opportunities for your your learners and what we have done is created a digital learning program which is looking at sort of the softer skills and with with these behaviors being online they are hosted on our platform which is known as learning hub we've got 13 self-directed learning programs and things like accountability adaptability commercial awareness decision making it may be that through your initial advice and guidance with the learner you identify that the learner would benefit from soft skill such as decision making which is important in any assessment practice there is the uh, online opportunity to use the learning hub to help support that so again, if you are already a Pearson Centre, you can speak to your account manager and they will be able to go through that in, in a lot more detail. As always, Pearson are recruiting for independent endpoint assessors. So if you are currently in an assessment role and you have vocational experience, what I've put on the slide here is some of the more common criteria each assessment plan has different requirements but as a minimum what we need is at least two years of occupational competence within the sector so what we mean by occupational competence is actual work within the sector as you can appreciate within endpoint assessment we are assessing we are acting in the role of an examiner so the assessor needs to be up to date up to speed with the sector to make sure that the apprentice receives a fair and valid grade a recognized assessor award so this is going back to the TACWA, the a1 the d3233 or this new epa assessors award now i can see a couple of questions relating to learners how would they get access to assessment for unit two once they are working towards this epa assessors award they would automatically meet the requirements of an independent endpoint assessor just as we do with tackle qualifications if we have a trainee assessor we put counter signature arrangements in place and it's exactly the same within endpoint assessment and then lastly the cv now many people's cvs will detail the jobs that they've held their roles and responsibilities but within endpoint assessment we have to confirm that through your experience or through your job history you meet all of the knowledge skills and behaviors of the assessment plan we are externally quality assured and Ofqual are starting the process now of becoming the only external quality assurance provider. So when Pearson do get audited, Ofqual will look at CVs of independent endpoint assessors against each individual knowledge, skills and behaviours. So it is a very specific activity. Again, I've put the link on to the Pearson job site. So once you get access to this slide deck and the recordings, you can click straight through. 
Okay, so what I will do now is I will go through the questions. And like I say, if anybody's got any any further questions, please feel free to drop them into the chat and then we can clarify as we go through. So if this is the first EPA course, where would we find a qualified endpoint assessor? So earlier on in the slide where I was talking about the approval process and the centre recognition process, part of your uh, centre staffing would need to look at what experience do your staff have in relation to endpoint assessment? Are they working in the role of an endpoint assessor for another endpoint assessment organisation? That would be one of the first sort of key activities to make sure that you're meeting the centre staffing requirements. With regards to upskilling training, if we as a centre have qualified assessors who just need to upskill in EPA, what I would suggest there is there are no bespoke EPA uh, training courses. But if your assessors are looking to expand their, their sort of remit, they could undertake endpoint assessor training with, with either Pearson or any other endpoint assessment organisation to then get the, the sort of the knowledge, skills and behaviours of what endpoint assessment practice and process is. That could be used as a CPD activity. So team are experienced assessors and internal verifiers. Um, we no longer run apprenticeships in house due to organisational changes. So we can run and achieve unit one. However, if there is no qualified EPA, how would we get unit two signed off? In that instance, again, looking at your staff matrix and seeing if any staff are independent endpoint assessors or and sort of vocationally competent, that would enable you to get unit two signed off. However, if I'm reading the question right, as assessors and internal verifiers with no experience of endpoint assessment, you won't be able to deliver unit one because that's part of the um, sort of centre staffing requirements. Can I can I just add, um, Andy? Just just yeah. one thing, um, and that is if you if um, if you will read the spec, you'll see that the requirements that we've got in place here are more flexible than you would expect for a kind of standard assessor qualification. And so, um, experience is considered is what is considered in order to be able to um, assess this qualification rather than it being purely on on the qualifications and what you're qualified for which actually is quite a big difference to to the other qualifications and we probably should have picked up in in more detail earlier thanks sarah so then there is an, a question around the counter signature what happens if it's a niche qualification so i think that question should be if it's a niche endpoint assessment lacking in anyone with epa experience so if it is a niche um, endpoint assessment Pearson will always have sort of endpoint assessors who will have the knowledge skills and behaviors for the standards we offer but i think that will be on a sort of case by case basis discussed with your standards verifier what we'll do is we'll get a, a fuller response and we'll make sure that that's in the FAQ which accompanies this. So another question in terms of organisation deems a level three assessor fit to assess EPAs as part of their internal processes. Again, there would need to be demonstrable evidence of what that level three assessor's um, knowledge, skills and behaviours are and relevance to endpoint assessment. 
So have they undertook endpoint assessment training? Have they, um, are they an active independent endpoint assessor who does under, who undertakes endpoint assessment for other endpoint assessment organisations? That would be the type of question and evidence that would need to be made available. So with the level three assessors course are uh, sufficient to assess EPAs as well. Again, depending on the assessment plan, the assessment plan always requires an independent endpoint assessor to hold a level three assessor award or a TACWA award. This qualification is for those learners who wish to progress into an endpoint assessor role. So that's where the unit one and the unit two comes in with regards to the knowledge and the skills. So with regards to existing assessors and verifiers, able to second line assess the skills unit. Again, this, the existing assessor verifier must have, uh, must have experience within endpoint assessment. If they have experience in endpoint assessment and experience in the vocational assessment area, then yes, they will be able to. So we have an existing um, work-based learning centre with qualified assessors and verifiers. Once you use this qualification as CPD, you're working with real apprentices in a real work situation, moving them towards a real EPA. Will that be valid for unit two? So the, the key there is the assessors and verifiers. So with regards to experience, it is experience supporting apprentices for endpoint assessment, as opposed to undertaking endpoint assessment. So the mindset from an on-programme assessor to an EPA assessor is very different and the assessment approach is different because the skills unit is looking at each of the key stages of EPA, such as signing gateway off, undertaking planning meetings, undertaking pre-assessment briefings. I think currently you're using this, uh, you want to use this qualification as a CPD you'd be fine for unit one, but not for unit two. So is there an observation requirement in the skills unit? So if the assessor is occupationally competent and has um, relevant vocational experience there is nothing to stop an observation happening because obviously observation is the primary source of evidence but one of the key considerations to make is for the unit two assessment if you're observing a planning meeting for example there is an apprentice that is actually undertaking that assessment so potentially in that planning meeting you would have the apprentice their employer, the learner, and then yourself. So there'll be four people involved in, in that meeting. And we've got to consider whether it's appropriate for the apprentice to feel under any pressure. So it's just one of those considerations that you need to make. Is it appropriate? Um, a link to Pearson training for the CPD. As much EPA activity is online, can an observation take place by the assessor joining in on the trainee EPA assessor's online assessment? So again, only if the in-house assessor is vocationally competent. With regards to the actual assessment, I would just have some considerations with regards to the security because in a lot of in a lot of assessments say for example professional discussion 
the questions that endpoint assessment organizations use are sort of like secure documents so i wouldn't encourage that because that could be seen as a breach of the security okay so that brings me pretty much to the end of the questions like i say i will be devising an faq which will be um posted on pearson's website sarah is there anything else that you'd like to add just before we finish off or if anybody's got any final questions or final thoughts no i don't i don't have anything um, more to add i think that that covers it okay so what i'll do is i will stay on the line for another couple of minutes if anybody does have any final questions or burning issues or thoughts if not thank you very much for your time i hope you found it useful and i hope you have a good rest of the afternoon yeah thank you very much everybody